Let us pray. Lord, as we turn to your word this morning, may you continue to change and challenge us, calling us to more obedient discipleship and greater faith. For love of Christ, the living word, we pray. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from John's Gospel, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. Listen now for the word of God. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the religious leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails in my hands in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have seen and come to me. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So the Sunday after Easter is an interesting day. For some churches, today is not the Sunday after Easter. It is Easter. Our Orthodox brothers and sisters are celebrating their highest holy day today. We operate on a different calendar that often affects our holy days. Some Christian churches celebrate Bright Sunday or Holy Humor Sunday on this Sunday after Easter. It's an ancient tradition revived in recent decades that was instituted to keep the joy of Easter going. And at some churches, it's celebrated with services filled with humor or laughter, or in other years, it might be celebrated with a picnic or an ice cream social after the service. More commonly, in my experience, the Sunday after Easter is known as Low Sunday, low Sunday. Pastors often call it low Sunday because of the sudden drop in attendance that usually occurs or because of the sudden slowdown that for us after Easter is many pastors, the pulp this Sunday, taking a vacation day or a vacation week or letting another staff member preach. In Kentucky, when I was a youth and family pastor working under a senior pastor, I preached more Sundays after Easter than I didn't, and I never got to preach on Easter until I was ordained and became your pastor. Actually, last year was the very first Easter sermon I ever preached. But in general, it's called Low Sunday because after the fanfare of Easter, after the drama of Holy Week with the sanctuary filled with flowers and brass instruments, this Sunday does often seem kind of ordinary and low. I think it's true, though, that the Sunday after Easter speaks more truly to where we find ourselves as modern day disciples or disciples who followed Jesus after Easter. And so it might prove to be an important Sunday to be present with one and paying close attention to what happened in the hours and days after Christ's resurrection. We often call ourselves Easter people, but today I'd like to suggest that actually 
we are second Sunday of Easter people. After all, we were not among Jesus's disciples on that first Easter. We missed it by about 2,000 years. We didn't have the opportunity to see Christ dead and wounded, placed in a borrowed tomb. We didn't have the chance to journey to that tomb while it was still dark, our hands filled with burial spices, only to see the stone rolled away. We have always lived in the time after Easter. We are the ones who believe because of the good news we have received through reading and listening with a long line of generations of disciples who received the good news before we did. We read and hear the gospel narratives, the eyewitness accounts found in several places in the New Testament, but we were not there. We cannot see and hear and touch what the first followers of Jesus were able to see and hear and touch. We are second Sunday of Easter, people. And what about these first disciples on that first Easter day? When our scripture begins, they are locked away for fear of the authorities, specifically the authorities that conspired together and oversaw Christ's crucifixion. They are hiding, afraid. We know what has already happened on that day because the Gospels give us a variety of accounts of the events. The Gospels named for Matthew, Mark, and Luke speak of the women who visited the tomb and heard the angel say that Jesus was no longer there, that he had risen from the dead. In John's gospel, Mary, Simon, and the beloved disciple, never named for us, but we might think it could be John, uh, they've all been to the tomb. We read that account last week with Mary coming and reporting that the tomb is empty and that Peter and the other disciple ran to see, to see for themselves. Alone at the tomb after that, Mary saw Jesus, at first confusing him with the gardener, you remember, but then he spoke to her and she spoke with him. And then she went back and she reported it to the 12. They have seen and heard the good news that Jesus is no longer dead, but very much alive. And still, verse 19 tells us that on that very same night, they are locked away, fearful for their lives. Verse 24 tells us that Thomas was not there with them. He's the one who is forever stuck with the nickname Doubting Thomas. And really, that's not fair. I have another pastor friend who calls him Good Question Thomas. <laughs> and I've also heard him called Thomas the Scientist because what he really did was, a was ask for evidence um, to the claim that had been made. But it's not just Thomas, right? All of the disciples are locked away out of fear and filled with doubt about what they had seen and heard. The truth is fear and doubt are a shared experience for disciples in all times and places. As second Sunday of Easter people, we experience this as we wrestle with the accounts of scripture, as we see God working in the world, as we deal with the general pitfalls and disappointments of life, small and large. The original Easter people deal with it too, as they have not yet made sense of what they have seen and heard. They're feeling very unsafe this first Easter evening. And still, even as they hid behind the locked doors, the remainder of verse 19 says that Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Christ meets disciples in the middle of their doubt and fear. Christ meets disciples in the middle of their doubt and fear. This happens twice in this passage. Christ meets the disciples behind the locked doors. Now, the irony is not lost on me. Do you think that Jesus appearing among them in that initial moment eased their fears? <laughs> I kind of don't think so. A man that they knew to be dead, a man they had seen entombed, the friend they had been grieving for two days. How is this happening? But death and locked doors and even questions or disbelief are not obstacles for God. And so Jesus, their friend and teacher, very much alive, comes to them in the locked room. He's with them while they are afraid. Jesus is with them before they understand what is happening. 
Now, Thomas wasn't there the first night. Who knows where he was, but he was missing when everyone else saw Jesus. And as much as Thomas loves and trusts his fellow disciples, it's a bit too good to be true, maybe. And so he asks his very good questions. And Jesus comes back to the upper room for Thomas's sake because Thomas's disbelief and doubt or questioning, they're not too great an obstacle for Jesus. He simply comes to Thomas, offers his hands, and allows him to find his way to understanding. The presence and peace of Christ are not only for those who have all of the answers and all of the understanding. Sometimes well-meaning Christians make it seem like that is true. If you would only have faith and not doubt, God will help you. If you and I know that sometimes we have some verses of scripture that make it seem that way, but that's why context is so important, why the whole story is important. Because when we read scripture broadly, what we see over and over is God who meets us exactly where we are, whatever state we are in, despite our disobedience or doubt or disillusionment. Because just like it was true for the original Easter people, it's also true for the second Sunday of Easter people. Jesus stands among us today offering peace in the midst of this present chaos and trouble. Here's something important to see here. Jesus gave the disciples peace. He did not take away most of the circumstances that were making them fearful. The disciples will still face danger. They would almost all eventually lay down their lives for the sake of the gospel. The difference is that they now do so as ones filled with the peace of Christ, as ones who have known the risen Lord and understood that Christ's peace transcends their circumstances. And that peace is for us too. When we say to one another, peace be with you on Sunday morning, for example, it's not just a churchy way to say hello. Saying this acknowledges that Christ's peace meets us in our circumstances, whatever they are as well. When Jesus comes to this locked room and speaks peace to his disciples, he is echoing words that he has already said to them, but perhaps they had not been ready to understand. In John 14, he and his disciples were in the upper room after he washed their feet. And he says in John 14, 27, it's recorded, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. Now, those words of Jesus are part of our funeral liturgy. I often read those words as opening sentences as a funeral service begins. Jesus says, my peace I give you, my peace I leave you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. But those words of Jesus are not only comfort for us at a funeral. Those words meet us and supply courage and hope in every place that does not make sense, every place where we struggle and believe that God can make order and bring good in the middle of chaos and pain. Today finds many of us worried with renewed anxiety or lingering anxiety that feels heavier by the day. Some of us are still having trouble sleeping some of us are growing weary of being in our homes or of leading the family schoolhouse. Some of us are fearful for our safety or health. Some of us are worried about our finances or businesses, or maybe we still haven't made the adjustment that the shift in work schedules and expectations requires. Some of us are concerned for our children our family members, our neighbors or friends who are struggling with one of those realities or another. Some of us are having trouble feeling hopeful about the future. And some of us might even be wondering, where could God possibly be in all this mess? The scripture assures us of this. God is with us. In our locked up homes, in our troubled circumstances, God is with us. 
Christ's peace does not eliminate the troubles of the world, the uncertainty and the chaos, but Christ's peace fills us and brings order and faith to our hearts and our minds, despite the uncertainty and chaos. And so finally, the peace of Christ gives disciples courage to believe even when they cannot see physical evidence. Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. It sounds almost like a rebuke when we read it in the wrong tone, but I don't think that Jesus is scolding Thomas for not being able to believe without seeing. I think Jesus is talking about us. All the disciples who would come to belief without being present in the locked room with the disciples on these nights and the day after the resurrection to the second Sunday of Easter people, we have not been to the freshly empty tomb. We have not heard the angels proclamation. We have not placed our fingers in the wounds of Christ. And yet we are invited to believe that Jesus is alive and in resurrection and that no matter what our present reality is, our peace, our hope, our life are in Christ. So wherever you are on your journey to faith and belief today, I want to invite you to share in the words of our most ancient creed of the church, the Apostles' Creed. Here's a beautiful thing. It's affirmed, affirmed in this scripture and in our shared life together. You do not have to have it all figured out 100% right now. Jesus meets you where you are. And together we confess what we believe, not because it's required that each of us believe everything about this today. We are the body of Christ together and our faith is shared with one another. And today you may have faith that I am not able to. And so we raise our voices together. The affirmation of faith is not meant to be a litmus test that proves our faithfulness, but it's a proclamation that we share and we carry together that points to God's faithfulness. And so I invite you, wherever you are, both physically and spiritually, to share in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May God bless you and keep you this day and always.